Okay, perfectly on time. So Anna will be chairing the first session. So Thanks, take Anna. it away, Anna. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Annie and David, for inviting me to be part of this uh, of this great workshop. So I'm not sure how I'll manage the session, but I'll try. So I'll introduce our uh, first invited talk chair, Professor Prince Henglein, and uh, he'll introduce the first invited talk. Well, thanks. For, thanks, Anna. Thanks for having me here, everybody. And of course, Annie and, and David, and there's wonderful, you know, actually, Great to hook up with, uh, you know, and see some of you again after, you know, some um, COVID years and in some cases, some decades. We just caught up with Eugenio just a second ago. And one of those people I'm really, really happy and proud to be able to introduce here is Ed, Ed Schoenberg. Uh, you know, Ed actually made the hopefully, uh, you know, decision that I, I, I won't ask him whether he ever regretted it, probably did, namely to hire <coughs> me as, as assistant research scientist at NYU um, at um, the start of, you know, a lot of exciting work, I thought at least uh, 1987. So uh, at that time, um, Ed had already, of course, you know, established uh, a lot of interesting work and, and uh, career actually in the sense of establishing Settle um, as, as a prototyping language for actually this brand new design of, of a language, which was, you know, a common um, common language actually for the, you know, issued by the DOD, uh, namely ADA. And uh, we'll hear a lot more about it because, you know, Ed then co-founded with uh, Robert Dewar, who is unfortunately not with us here or anymore, uh, um, the, uh, the GNU ADA, well, GNU ADA um, version of ADA and also the company that provides uh, support to this day. Um, so we're really looking forward to this. Um, but so as I mentioned before, Settle um, has, uh, has, a, has had, um, you know, a lot of interesting um, impact and we'll get to see some more, actually, I hope. Uh, in this uh, uh, project, and I'm, I was really proud to go there. But to focus on on some of Ed's things, you know, um, so there was the data definition language. Actually, I think we'll get back to this. I'll get back to this. this was an early, early contribution of Settle, and um, um, and but there was also the initiative that uh, you know was driven also in part by in great part by Ed on uh, on Griffin, a common pro prototyping language. Um, to bring actually some very high level notions of, of bulk data types that we've seen in Settle and, uh, and transactional properties and various other parts in, into life. That was another great big project that I was uh, happy to join. And on a more personal level, Ed was also the one who once stormed in um, and, and said, uh, you know, there's this kind of self-applicable partial evaluation and these crazy people in Copenhagen are actually implementing it. I mean, this is completely insane. It turns out that's where I went. So uh, thank you, Ed. Um, you know, this was um, a very good um, introduction to the topic, I have to say. And uh, on a personal note, also uh, as a research scientist, I, I was a, I was a PhD student basically. I came in one day. It's like I was working twelve to twelve, right, noon to midnight. You know, and uh, I once went into Ed, and it's like, oh, Ed, is it even okay that I come so late to work? I don't know how to do this with you know the employment stuff. And then he all of a sudden it struck him. It's like, oh, that's what you're talking about. He said. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter when you put in your 80 hours of work. And we both laughed. That was um, that was the introduction um, of Ed. I, uh, um, Ed was going to take it away now. Thanks for having me here again and great opportunity to see you again, Ed. Thank you so much, uh, Fritz. It's wonderful to uh, see you and thanks for uh, bringing all these memories back. And I should also say a thank you very much to David and Annie for organizing this conference. Uh, an occasion to uh, meet, indeed, old associates and friends, uh, and to discuss topics that are dear to all our hearts. Um, uh, let me uh, share my screen here, if this is possible. Um, <laughs> um, I uh, want to speak about a large scale experiment in prototype settle that was used uh, to um, devise the formal definition and then a working compiler for ADA, uh, which is a language is most likely uh, seldom mentioned in uh, LPOP. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I should say that this is a um, particularly propitious time to speak about it uh, because just as we are talking, uh, there is an announcement being made in Livermore at the National Ignitions Facility uh, indicated that they have achieved 
uh, nuclear fusion today in the uh, National Ignition Facility. And I know that 25 years ago, they were planning on using ADA uh, to drive the device. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, talk will have to refer a lot to, uh, to um, departed dear friends and mentors to all of us, um, Jack Schwartz and Robert Dewar. Um, Jack was, among many other things, the designer of Settle. Um, he was uh, a mathematician of world class. Uh, he came to be interested in computer science in the early 60s, uh, was told by a uh, very rigorous member of the mathematics department at NYU that he should drop this interest in this fad of computers and come back to do serious work. Um, he was, uh, at the time, the author of uh, a major encyclopedia called Linear Operators, which was everything that was known in the world about Hilbert spaces at the time. Uh, he got interested in um, issues of uh, programming, um, as I said, in the early uh, 60s, uh, developed a close contact with John Koch um, from IBM. Uh, and um, they wrote together um, another encyclopedia, Endeavor, which is called uh, Programming Languages and Their Compilers. Um, this is in the early 60s, uh, surveying a number of different languages and the way in which they were implemented. Uh, and this included, apart from uh, the um, uh, imperative and functional languages of the time, something like Snowball, for example, which was certainly not discussed in particular uh, in computer science circles. Uh, he went to, um, and uh, uh, the uh, book on programming languages uh, was full of algorithms, of course, but they were all written in uh, what used to be called at the time pseudo algol. Uh, and uh, he found it necessary to have a uh, more compact and higher level notation to describe these algorithms. As a mathematician, he did consider that set theory was the lingua franca of all branches of mathematics, and it was reasonable to have it uh, as a, um, a basis um, uh, for uh, a, an executable uh, programming language. Uh, Robert Dewar came to uh, NYU, um, recruited by uh, Jack. Um, he was uh, the most brilliant programmer I have known. Um, he uh, was at the time already a member of the Algol 68 committee, uh, had um, uh, created an extraordinary efficient implementation of Snowball called Spitball, um, and uh, wrote absolutely a beautiful uh, crystal clear software, uh, an art which uh, everybody that uh, came in contact with him admired enormously. Um, he uh, developed um, uh, with the, he improved actually uh, both the syntax and the semantics of Settle considerably uh, over the years, participated in its implementation, uh, rewrote the garbage collector to make it uh, an order of magnitude faster than the original. Uh, and then uh, went on to uh, lead the, the ADA uh, project. Uh, next, please. Um, I don't know if this uh, title will resonate uh, with everybody. Uh, probably for people of a certain age, it will. Uh, it is the name, the title of uh, Ken Iverson's um, Turing Award lecture, uh, which is an extremely elegant presentation of APL. Uh, it is a very tutorial introduction to the various operators in the language. Um, and uh, step by step, uh, he um, demonstrates how uh, extremely elegant and, of course, very compact algorithms um, can be um, constructed using uh, these uh, primitives. Uh, if you have not seen it or if you have forgotten last time you read it, I must recommend it uh, because it is indeed a very beautiful description of a formalism 
that is both um, rigorous um, and, of course, extremely compact. Um, uh, APL has uh, had um, an influence, an ongoing influence on programming languages. Um, the language itself evolved. J is a more recent variant. Um, Python has adopted NumPy because it is an extremely convenient um, uh, notation uh, for operations on multidimensional array. MATLAB is much inspired by it. And in Settle, uh, there were a couple of borrowings uh, of uh, syntax uh, that seem to be particularly convenient and um, compact. However, um, the language uh, APL um, is still uh, considerably um, controversial, let's say. There are um, uh, a very active, uh, isolated community of APL uh, users, and uh, it is considered uh, extremely awkward by most of the rest of the software industry, uh, and uh, this would require a separate discussion. But the interesting thing about it is that, uh, as far as I know, uh, its use for large-scale systems uh, is uh, essentially non-existent but it is ideal for describing algorithms, in particular algorithms that deal with multidimensional arrays. So this is a uh, rather specialized application. Uh, one of the things that should be mentioned about the language before we move on to Settle is that APL, because it is extremely compact and depends on just a few operations that generalize uh, to um, multiple dimensions and so on and so forth, uh, is the first language that actually uh, got a formal rigorous definition. And uh, Susan Gerhard wrote a beautiful thesis about the um, uh, semantics of APL, uh, which was both <laughs> uh, compact and rigorous. Um, Jack uh, was very aware of uh, APL and Ken Iverson's work. And at some point, uh, Jack had written an algorithm for um, transitive closure. He was very proud of the way it read in Settle and sent a note to Ken Iverson asking, how would you write this in APL? And um, Ken Iverson answered with uh, five characters um, uh, saying, uh, I have not thought particularly about performance uh, or compactness in writing this. This is what comes to mind. Um, Jack passed around uh, this uh, answer uh, with a chuckle, but uh, the main thing is that uh, Settle did not derive otherwise its inspiration from a purely algebraic formalism, which is, uh, I think, interesting. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, from uh, the uh, uh, experience describing um, algorithms for um, program uh, manipulation for uh, language construction and so on and so forth, uh, Jack uh, adopted uh, an imperative style, a procedural style, um, but there were still these uh, ideas about uh, the ease of uh, writing and um, the language tries to be compact and in particular it is dynamically typed. Um, there are no uh, declarations, no indication of what um, the construction of the objects that appear in the program um, denotes, uh, except from uh, reading how objects are themselves manipulated. Uh, there is relatively uh, little concern um, with um, what one might call uh, software glue, uh, how various pieces of a program are actually assembled, at least in the original language. Uh, one presents uh, the uh, program as one unit and the whole thing gets uh, compiled. Uh, there is global visibility um, and uh, essentially everybody can see everything else. Uh, and uh, this is quite central, there is a complete disregard for efficiency. Um, Jack used to say essentially memory is free um, and, <laughs> Uh, there was a sense that uh, machine cycles are also uh, free, but in any case, um, the essence of an algorithm could be described um, without consideration of uh, efficiency. And later on, 
uh, we will see how um, to improve upon it. Let's go to the next slide. And uh, the, uh, one of the results, which from a research point of view was extremely uh, productive, uh, was that uh, if the construction is extremely inefficient, there is enormous uh, opportunity for improving on it. Uh, and uh, several uh, thesis uh, papers, areas of research emerged uh, out of the original language. Uh, the first one that came up was type inference. I think that the first work that uh, in the Settle group was a thesis by Aaron Tenenbaum. Um, and uh, there the problem that was at the time uh, quite uh, challenging um, was uh, how to infer the structure of nested sets. If you have sets of sets of tuples or whatever, uh, is it possible to determine to give a full description um, of the uh, uh, object in question just from the way they are used? Uh, strand reduction, which is an optimization that first introduced uh, in uh, relation to loops and uh, Fortran, um, led to the very uh, productive uh, work of uh, Bob Page and uh, Annie later um, on uh, loop optimizations in general and program transformations uh, that amount to um, uh, what uh, I think Jack coined the term, a uh, formal differentiation, uh, where uh, something of uh, uh, order x to the n can be transformed in x to the n minus one uh, by the appropriate uh, replacement of code. Uh, data structuring, um, was for quite a while the, the focus on optimization of the language because the idea was that sets, um, general uh, as they are, um, allowed a very compact description of operations. Uh, but choosing the proper representation for sets was uh, a separate step uh, in the description of uh, an efficient algorithm and could be separated from the original specification. So um, the idea was that uh, if you have a set that is used in a particular way, for example, depends on some ordering, uh, then trees might be uh, the proper structure to choose, but this can be done uh, by annotating an existing set of program and saying, at this point, I want this particular data structure to be used. Um, and uh, finally, um, and quite uh, importantly, uh, if the algorithm is compact, uh, there is a better chance that one can prove that it is actually correct, uh, assuming that we can provide a rigorous um, specification of what the algorithm should, uh, should do. And uh, the work of uh, Eugenio and his collaborators went in that direction uh, and uh, did uh, uh, enormously for the development of uh, theorem proving techniques. Uh, I should add as a personal note that I learned Settle um, in the early days uh, uh, by debugging the algorithms in uh, Jack's book. And the ones that uh, I got were uh, theorem proving algorithms that uh, Jack had uh, written um, with the collaboration of Martin Davis. Uh, let's go to the uh, next slide. Uh, the NYU uh, ADA project uh, started when um, ADA appeared on the scene. Um, it was a, a language that the Department of Defense uh, commissioned um, uh, in, I guess, the mid-70s. Um, the problem that the DOD was facing was that, according to the legend, it had something like 500 different programming languages to maintain. Uh, some of which had uh, three users and one developer that had moved to the South Seas. Uh, and this was, um, to say the least, awkward. And they wanted to have a single uh, wide spectrum language that could be used for all the applications within a DOD, scientific and otherwise. Um, the design project took several um, long range studies, starting with something uh, uh, called uh, uh, Straw Man and ending with a document called Iron Man, um, uh, Steel Man, excuse me, um, that was actually a set of specification for what the language should be able to do. Um, 
this looked like a very exciting software project in general. Uh, there was a source of funding um, out of uh, a um, military post in New Jersey, I think. And uh, Robert and Jack went to propose um, to study optimization issues for this new language uh, using all the work on optimization that was being done at NYU on Settle. Um, this appeared to be a perfectly reasonable thing. Uh, but then the language was at the time, uh, what would become ADA, uh, exceedingly ill-defined, uh, and uh, there was no way to study uh, optimization techniques for it if there was not a rigorous definition of the language. And what they proposed uh, is to provide a complement to whatever design document would be uh, produced by uh, the DOD. Um, and then in the form of a, formable, a, a formal executable definition of the language. So um, formal because it is a program, uh, executable because it will be uh, in settle, uh, and uh, relatively rigorous because one could see um, more easily the correspondence between the description of this implementable form and uh, the natural language description of the language. The next, please. Um, and um, the issue of soft prototyping is uh, the one that is central to, uh, I guess, the discussions today. Um, on one hand, in order to be a prototype, uh, it has to be reasonably small uh, in the sense that users can grasp uh, the, the whole contents. At the same time, uh, readability is critical, and this is an issue uh, that is, I think, central to the whole conversation today. How do we manage to uh, have both? Um, APL uh, could not be, uh, is of course a, a kind of limit point of conciseness, uh, but it's always this uh, criticized or joked about in terms of readability. Um, there is something about algebraic notation uh, that is, of course, one of the great discoveries of Western civilization. At the same time, we are very bad at reading complex algebraic formulae. Um, PV equals NRT or uh, <clears throat> A equals MC squared are directly understandable. Uh, but expressions that take um, 20 characters uh, are impenetrable. Um, and therefore, a language, an imperative language, I think, uh, was a natural choice um, for this uh, specification. Um, there is the issue of uh, describing the language semantics um, as precisely as possible. And here uh, the passage is difficult because the first description is given uh, in natural language. There were at the time, of course, various models to describe um, formal semantics of programming languages, in particular uh, the notational semantics. Robert had just uh, come from working on the ALGO 68 committee, uh, but two-level grammars were uh, out of the question. Um, and therefore, it appeared that having an executable compact definition was actually an excellent complement to the other ways in which the language would be defined. Uh, next, please. So um, the requirements that uh, the uh, DOD uh, imposed on this were, uh, first of all, safety. Um, namely, um, the language should do as much as possible uh, to prevent common programming errors. Uh, it should be portable. Uh, that is to say, there are a large number of hardware uh, targets for it, and the language should be defined in a way which is target independent, and it should be readable. Once again, this is a uh, critical uh, requirement here, and the point is that um, uh, the DOD needs to deal with very long-lived systems, um, and for these, um, the possibility of uh, having a new generation of programmers take over the maintenance of a given system uh, is indispensable. So the language has to be as much as possible geared more towards readability than writability uh, in terms of um, uh, maintainability. Uh, Fran Allen used to explain how the performance of the 
IBM Fortran optimizer uh, decreased over time. And the reason for that was that there were extremely complicated algorithms in there. And when bugs were found in them, uh, 10 years after the system was written, new programmers found it extremely hard to fix the problem. And it was easier to just disable an optimization, uh, which uh, fixed the original complaint, but made the whole system less efficient. So this issue of readability is still critical to everything we do uh, when programming on the large. And um, Ada insisted that the language should be as readable as possible. The immediate result in terms of language design um, is that the syntax is verbose and uh, everybody has always reproached the language with um, the fact that there is a very large number of keywords and that um, uh, programs were long, but um, uh, users will agree that uh, it is actually easier to parse, but this is a discussion from some other time. Um, and uh, technically, uh, the important things uh, that uh, the uh, requirements of the DOB uh, imposed were uh, the language had to have concurrency. It had to be able to describe multiple parallel processes. It had to uh, have real-time constraints. It must be uh, able to speak about intervals and delays. Uh, it has to have facilities to interface to other languages. And most importantly, um, the type system must be such that uh, it favors, it permits separate compilation. So uh, a library will have information about the type defined within, and any use of the language will check uh, that uh, the use uh, of the types is legal. Let's uh, move on. So the net result is that uh, there were essentially three um, uh, parallel definitions of the language. There was, on the one hand, uh, the reference manual written uh, in excellent English. Um, Jean Ishbia was the uh, head of the winner group. Uh, it was an international competition. There was a, com a validation test suite developed by uh, John Goodenough at Softec at the same time as the language was being designed. And there was the executable definition as an interpreter written in Settle. Um, the uh, Compiler validation was, uh, in, was novel in at least one respect. Um, it included not only executable programs that had to run correctly, but also illegal programs that had to be diagnosed properly. And the idea was this would impose um, a guarantee that there were no uh, special language extensions that a given vendor would provide so that, language, that, so that programs would be really portable from one implementation to another. Let's um, move on. Um, and um, the uh, interpreter that uh, came out of uh, the NYU WIDA project was essentially um, a model of what the denotational definition of the language might be. Um, and um, the uh, interpreter manipulates these various sets. And let me go quickly through them to uh, explain. Um, what they represent. Um, there is a map called contents, uh, which is essentially a map of memory. But uh, for, um, Settle has no notion of pointers. So uh, this is a mapping defined from atoms, which are internally generated uh, object whose only purpose is to serve um, as the domain of definition of a map. And the contents associates uh, one of these atoms uh, with the value that it contains. And uh, there is another um, map uh, called EMAP that associates a name with possibly um, one of these atoms or its contents. Uh, there is a, a sequence, um, a statement sequence, which is a tuple, uh, which corresponds at any given time to the instructions to be executed and the interpreter describes explicitly how this is modified uh, under control structures, communication between tasks, and so on and so forth. There is uh, a value stack, which is the runtime stack on which uh, you place uh, um, operands for operations. And uh, the uh, um, uh, interpreter uh, applies um, the operation on top of the execution stack 
to the values on top of the uh, value stack. And there is an environment stack, which is a stack of environments, uh, which essentially um, creates closures for all the subprograms um, that are currently active. <clears throat> so um, the environment stack includes uh, a map uh, of um, from identifier to structure. So you pass uh, types that you have declared. Uh, it includes the current uh, set of uh, statements to be executed and the current top of the stack of the exit of the uh, value stack. Uh, next slide, please. So tasking, as I said, is modeled explicitly. There is a set of active tasks. There is a mapping that relates tasks to their priority. There is a set of tasks that are ready to run. Others may be delayed. Uh, there are tasks that are waiting for a call. There are tasks that are ready. There are tasks that are delayed. And uh, there is a uh, non-determinism built in because uh, several of the operations in Settle um, are essentially non-deterministic. The retrieval of an element from a stack, it can essentially pick up an arbitrary element, um, does conveniently map into the fact that some operations on a parallel system uh, are themselves um, uh, non-deterministic. You don't know necessarily who is going to run next. If you want to specify this, you have to specify priorities explicitly. Let's go to the next uh, slide. So uh, here is a small fragment of uh, Settle um, that describes what is done for every instruction in the interpreter. As I said, the interpreter takes the current uh, set of uh, statements, picks up the first one and does something with it, uh, possibly modifying the, se the sequence of statements to be executed. Uh, putting stuff on the stack and so on and so forth. So um, it takes um, the set of delayed tasks and looks if uh, any of them um, has a delay of zero. Uh, there is internally a clock that counts just instructions that determines when a task has expired its delay. Um, this uh, portion of code is marked as a critical section, uh, although uh, this is a symbolic, there is nothing in the execution that mentions this, but disable and enable indicate that this is an action that should not be interrupted by an another task. So it picks up uh, from the current task, a body. Uh, it puts that task in the set of ready tasks, removes it from the set of delayed tasks. And the important thing in here is that the set of statements to be executed is now modified by having in front uh, the body of the task. So in the loop uh, that corresponds to the overall interpreter, the next thing to happen is that the first instruction in the uh, task body will be executed. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, and um, this is what happens uh, when the instruction is a call. Um, the instruction um, includes the procedure to be invoked and the set of actuals, another tuple. Um, the environment stack now includes uh, the environment in which this subprogram was declared, uh, which is essentially capturing in a closure all the global variables that it might mention. Uh, it installs uh, the environment map. It produces a binding between the actuals and the formal service of program, empties uh, the um, uh, value stack, and the statement sequence becomes the body of the subprogram. And the next um, <coughs> pass through the interpreter loop executes the first statement in the, um, in the body of the subprogram. Um, let's go to the next slide. And uh, this really is a summary of why the resulting interpreter, uh, which is uh, a few thousand lines of uh, code, mostly comments, um, is successful in describing uh, the uh, semantics of the language. The fact that we can use sets and mappings for everything, the fact that um, we have value semantics, there is no sharing, and um, therefore um, no um, danger of accidental modification of shared structures. 
Uh, quantified expressions are um, an extremely compact way of describing um, uh, iterative procedures. Um, and uh, something that is, uh, uh, sense a, a trivial bit of syntax, but is extremely useful, is the simplified pattern matching. The fact that the tuple can appear on the left-hand side of an assignment um, and thereby unpack several uh, components of it and give them local names that they can be used in the code below. Um, it is uh, an extremely uh, easy to understand and powerful um, construct. Um, and the fact that um, the whole, all the components of the execution become objects, uh, this reification of all the parts of uh, the execution uh, are what makes uh, this uh, description, I think, uh, very successful. Let's uh, move on to the next slide. Um, what I haven't discussed and which would actually um, less of a concern uh, in the first version of Settle uh, was the static semantics. So the interpreter assumes that uh, all um, type checking has been uh, verified, um, uh, that uh, um, libraries have been appropriately loaded and so on and so forth. Uh, the um, parser that was created was an LALR parser. Um, it was written by Gerald Fisher, who was a, a good friend of Robert, who had spent a lot of time in industry uh, working with um, uh, uh, Robert uh, in the design of various uh, workstations, actually. Um, and uh, coming from industry, he imposed uh, on the project some um, uh, very beneficial industrial practices like uh, using uh, source control uh, uh, for uh, the development, uh, which was uh, something quite novel for an unruly group of graduate students working on the project at the time. Um, the uh, explicit environment manipulation makes everything that has to do with type checking simpler. Um, separate compilation, as I mentioned, was an important requirement in the language. And um, this means that uh, you can group pieces of compiled code. Um, and um, the, the semantics of the language specifies that essentially the declaration of all types, objects, and packages is something that happens at runtime. As a result, uh, there is the issue that a given um, variable may invoke a procedure defined elsewhere, and it is necessary for that procedure to have been elaborated before it is called. Uh, as a result, there is an ordering imposed uh, on um, the various packages and units mentioned in the program, and they must be elaborated in a particular order. So um, the uh, system also constructs a dependency graph and does a transitive closure over it to determine the order in which the various pieces of the program must be loaded and executed. And again, to make the system um, serve as a formal definition that is usable to practitioners, uh, the internal representation uh, is uh, very close to the source syntax and uh, strings using the names in the program are used throughout. Um, type resolution is one place where uh, set notation actually turns out to be um, extremely convenient. Um, the language uh, permits uh, heavy overloading uh, of subprograms. Uh, and if you have an operation, for example, an addition, where F and G are uh, functions that it may be overloaded, um, <clears throat> um, the um, resolution uh, has to be done in two phases. On the first one, all the possible interpretations of F and G um, are collected. Uh, and then you have to take the intersection of them uh, to find the ones that have the same type because the operation uh, of course, requires um, objects of the same type. I'm speaking here about a predefined arithmetic uh, object. Uh, and in the down downward pass of the tree, um, once you have established the identity uh, of the given overloaded symbol, 
Um, if you know its identity, you know the types of its formal parameters, and you use those to resolve uh, in turn the actuals in the call, which themselves may be overloaded. Uh, so uh, sorry for interrupting it. Um, sorry, um, we, yes. you know, every, you know, I know. It, do you have many slides to go, or uh, is it just uh, uh, just keeping an eye on on uh, on the program? Um, I am more than half done, but um, there are a few other things that I would like to discuss. I'm sorry. Um, um, can you pick some that you think would be, and maybe we can, you know, then during the discussion, pick some of those things up? Uh, yes, of course. Possible. Um, I think that uh, in terms of uh, the use of settle here, I am essentially done. Um, let's go back to one slide, uh, the one uh, right following. Uh, okay, the, the following one. Um, so, um, in terms of prototyping, I have to say that uh, the original um, NYU ADA uh, model did much more with runtime semantics than with the static semantics. Um, there was some sense that, in a sense, this is more routine, uh, I guess. Uh, but it has turned out uh, in the development of uh, successive versions of the language uh, that in the static semantics, there are some uh, issues that are quite complex uh, to resolve that require uh, intricate algorithms. And it is not clear um, how exactly um, a very high level uh, definition uh, would help. Um, and uh, I mentioned here, um, one in particular, uh, what is called uh, freezing points, um, which is an indication in the program of the point at which a given entity can be used. Um, if you have something like a private type, for example, you cannot create an object of that type unless you have seen the full definition of the type. And uh, the separation of private and uh, full uh, descriptions of the type establish then some kind of non-locality and a code generator must know uh, at what point an um, entity can be elaborated. That turns out to be uh, a very complex problem in um, the implementation of the language. Uh, among implementers, it is known as the heart of darkness. Uh, and I don't know uh, in full whether um, a um, high level specification would help in this particular context. Okay. Um, are you are you sorry? I've, are you okay? Sorry, you are okay? I'm just okay. wondering how how much you have left here because we're sort of a little bit late, and and Annie is is sort of like in a very friendly fashion looking at me. Okay. Um. In uh, that case, uh, let us go uh, forward. I wanted to speak about the evolution um, of Ada uh, following the initial uh, prototype. Um, but uh, this is probably at this point uh, superfluous. Um, um, the language is now uh, 30 something years old and has evolved with other programming languages along the way. And has Wait, which slide, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's go, uh, let's go back two slides. Um, uh, this is jumping forward. Um, the language uh, has followed, of course, trends in the design of other programming languages and has adopted um, a number of uh, ideas that have become uh, essentially um, generally uh, accepted. Um, keeping uh, in mind that uh, safety is still a central concern uh, of the language. Uh, the result is that um, programming by contract um, has become central to the way the language is uh, uh, used and uh, pre and post conditions uh, appear. And the definition of the language of the standard libraries now include the pre and post conditions uh, for all the operations of interest, including, for example, uh, the uh, set container uh, library. Uh, reduction uh, is a very powerful contract map to use. Uh, it's uh, an idiom that everybody uh, needs to use, uh, and uh, it is now uh, present in uh, in the language. 
Um, uh, there are iterators and uh, quantified expressions. There are arbitrary arithmetic packages, and there is a uh, low-level um, uh, parallelism, uh, which is still being discussed and uh, not implemented by uh, most uh, compilers. Um, Great. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, um, uh, this is fine. Um, I, I wanted to uh, mention some difficulties in the implementation of the uh, latest version of the language, but uh, this is not uh, particularly important. And uh, this is the um, uh, moderate conclusion I want to draw um, is that um, it is not clear with the language of this uh, size now and of this richness, if you want, um, that uh, prototyping in a high level manner uh, will be particularly fruitful. Um, we do have internally uh, a, um, a language development group. This is at uh, Adacore. And when new features are suggested, uh, we prototype them, but we prototype them uh, within the existing compiler. The language is rich enough uh, that we have a library of high level construct that we can use uh, to see how well a given uh, construct fits um, in the existing uh, structure. Uh, among things that are being considered are more general pattern matching, um, uh, some um, additional uh, connection to um, new hardware, in particular uh, GPUs is, is being actively discussed and prototyped within ADA uh, itself. Um, right. Oh, sorry. Um, and uh, this is uh, the only conclusion that I can draw. Um, the industry uh, has a slew of competing languages, some of them with uh, narrow domains of application, some of them that claim to be very general purpose. And uh, my sense uh, is that uh, language words are uh, pointless and uh, that uh, we have uh, to be able to uh, speak multiple languages to develop large scale software. Thanks, Ed. Sorry, I interrupted you several times. No, 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 I'm sorry. I, there were too many other things I wanted to discuss, but oh, these are from other that, times. Yes. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm in the awkward position of pushing you since, uh, and it's not because of that. I, I wish, I'd, you know, because I'm, I'm the one after you, maybe Annie and David cleverly actually put me there. So I would be, uh, you know, uh, pushing you. So, uh, but uh, thanks again, Ed. Um, and um, apropos poly polyglot, I think uh, uh, that uh, that describes you. So, uh, well, thanks. <laughs> and we'll move on in the.